church say amen again? Amen. We really want to praise the Lord for sacred music. Amen. And we thank God for the way he speaks to our hearts, even through music. Amen. And I, pro I pray that we all see him as one who is holy, righteous, just, and good. Amen. The message that God has given me to give to you all at such a time as this, I know it's a very simple message, but at the same time, I want to encourage you to really pray as you listen, because there'll be things that will be said, sadly, that will bypass some ears. But then there will be those who will hear, and they will know that God is speaking directly to them, to their heart and to their heart needs. And so I want you to be very prayerful because I believe that what I'm going to be sharing with you at this time is very crucial when it comes to the work that God has called us to do at such a time as this. And so as we prepare our hearts to receive the message, uh, as you have seen in our custom, we go to our knees in prayer. And if you can kneel, let's kneel in prayer together. If you can't kneel, just bow your heads. Let's let the Lord speak to our heart. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege to hear your voice. Make your words plain to our heart, we pray, and truly open our eyes and help us behold wondrous things out of your word. Forgive us, we pray, of our sins, and thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. When you think of the things happening in our world right now, you know, I look at what's going on in the world, I look at what's going on in the church, and one of the first things that I see is a work that's beyond me. <laughs> there's no one person, there's no one ministry that's going to be a solution to the problems that exist in our world and in our church. God must have a people, a number, a group of jewels that he can bring together that literally have so much of the mind of Christ that when people walk and come in contact with us, they will say, as has been said in the days of Pentecost, these men and these women must have been with Jesus. Amen. We're living in a time that the father of the church of Satan, who taught a principle that we see it lived out today, especially today, in a most marked manner. And if you're visiting with us, you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, I want to welcome you. And thank God for you being here because the purpose of our existence is for you. Amen. And there is something that is needed to be said to the world at large, those who are not part of this faith, as well as to those of us who are a part of this faith. The founder of the Church of Satan, Alistair Crowley, he taught a statement that you see reflected throughout our world even today. And it was basically three words. Four, forgive me. Do what thou wilt. Do what you want. You feel it, do it. Don't hold back. And it is amazing how that principle we see not just in the church of Satan, but you can find it in the churches of God, you can find that thought process even amongst the remnant, and we most certainly see it in the world. When I was again in the streets of Portland and I saw people, they were doing what they wanted. They were saying what they want. They were acting what they want. Today, there's a theology, a, a, a teaching. If you're feeling this way, you must have been born this way, and therefore it's all right to live this way. And I kind of marvel at it 
and, and I understand that there are ramifications that will come for this, but we're living in a time where the people of God must develop courage in the midst of everybody else's treason. This is not a time for us to stand in agreement with the world, to muzzle our voices and to make it seem like we no longer have a doctrine or a principle or a God in heaven who is designed to protect us, to keep us, and to help us stand for his truth. And yes, there will be ramifications for teaching the truth, but somebody has to love the brothers and sisters in this world enough to let them know that there is something God hates, and it is called sin. Yes. Amen. And God hates it in all of its forms. Amen. Jesus has made his words very clearly, and I don't care if you are the president of the United States. If you contradict the word of God... That is a calling for the people of God to stand up Amen. and to say, thus far and no further, we can agree with you on such points, but on these points, we cannot agree with you. Amen. You see, the Bible says something in Matthew, the 19th chapter. Go to Matthew 19. In Matthew 19, there was a question that came to Jesus, and I like how Jesus answered it. And I want you to see what the Bible says in Matthew, the 19th chapter. And when you get there, you let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says in Matthew, the 19th chapter, it says right there in verse 1, and it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? They always had questions, but they weren't looking for answers. They were looking for entrapment. Jesus, being wise, said something very beautiful in his answer. And I want you to look at what he said. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? Stop right there. Notice how even Jesus, when they came to him with inquiries, he pointed them back to the word, Amen. right? He said, haven't you read? You read this, haven't you? And the Bible says going on, have you not read that he which made them at the when time? What time? Beginning. At the beginning. What did he make them? He said he made them what? Male and, Male and female. And said, now watch this. There's something in the Bible for those who are good students of the Bible. There is something called parallelism, where you're making one point, but it's being expressed in more than one way, okay? That's a biblical principle when you study the Bible. It's called parallelism. Jesus is using parallelism. Watch this. Let's look at that again. He said, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them what? Male and then female. Now watch what he does next in verse 5. And said... For this cause shall a what? Man. Man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. That was parallelism. That's right. You understand that? In verse 4, he said male. In verse 5, that is a man. Amen. Then he said in verse 4, female. And then in verse 5, he said wife. You understand that? Yeah. So Jesus was very, very clear. The only person that can be a wife according to the beginning of time is a female. Right. The only person that can be a man or a husband is someone who is a male. And this was very clear in Scripture. Now, I don't mind when the world does what they do because they're worldlings. You understand that? I cannot expect a turtle to act like a horse. You understand that? So if you're in the world, you're going to do what worldlings do. And worldlings, the Bible says, does sin. That's, that, that's clear to me. But my confusion is when the church, the ones who profess to believe the Bible, and then there are places where there are churches that believe present truth, the truth for these times. And we're seeing that there is also an endorsement for 
gay unions in marriage and all these other things, and we're trying to do that in the name of love, I'm thinking to myself, that is a love that even Jesus doesn't know. You understand that? We owe to the world God's love to the point that we have to love them enough to do something that a lot of times people don't connect with love. Go to Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, there's something that the Word of God connects with love that a lot of times we don't necessarily consider this to be a demonstration of love, but it is. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3. It was right after God was speaking to the last church, the last people of God as a body. And the Bible referred to them as Laodicea, the people of the judgment. A condition that is horrible, a disease of all diseases, thinking they're all right when they're all wrong. And all of us at some point and perhaps presently are stricken with this disease while we might think we're disease free. And as God began to show the Laodiceans their true condition, thou sayest thou art rich and increased with goods and have needed nothing, but knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. As as he was showing that out, he began to provide the remedy. Thank God that Jesus provides a remedy. And that remedy in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Amen. He wants to heal the sick. But in verse 19, he says, as many as I hate. Is that what the verse says? No, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repent. Rebuking, chastening, and calling to repentance is a demonstration of the love of God. Amen. Can you imagine that? Right. Now, not everyone does this right. You see, some people rebuke and chasten and, and do these things with a great big smile on their face. You can almost see the joy when you look at the camera, when you watch certain videos. You can almost see it when you look at certain uh, you know, YouTube channels and you watch certain ministers sometimes, and, and they're, they're calling out sin, but they almost seem like there's an enjoyment in calling it out. You know, in human communication, there are three things that people typically pay attention to, but a lot of times we don't understand the order. The first thing that people pay attention to most in human communication is your body language. They're paying attention to your body language. Second thing they're paying attention to is your tone of your voice. The third thing they pay attention to, but it's usually the last thing on the list, are your actual words. So sometimes people can say, God loves you, but they can say it in a way that by their body language and their tone of voice, they sound like they don't even believe what they're saying. That's why when I read Steps to Christ, page 12, when Jesus got to that place where he had to rebuke those Pharisees for their hypocritical lifestyles. Jesus, it broke his heart to do that. Amen. It says there were tears in his voice as he gave his scathing rebukes. He knew I have to give the scathing rebukes. But there was tears and it. it broke his heart. It was not a point of joy. It didn't bring him happiness. We got to learn how to rebuke like that if we ever do rebuke. Yes. See, some of us right now, if we were to get into the rebuking ministry, some of us would do more damage than good. That's why God has to allow a process that we're going to talk about. He has to allow a process to take place. Because there's a whole lot of do what thou wilt. We have a president today that says do what thou wilt. He speaks what he wills. He does what he wills. And as a result of this, we see in our world today that from the top of the most powerful nation on earth, we are seeing a lot of expressions of saying what you want, doing what you want, feeling what you want. That spirit is taking hold of the people in sweeping numbers. So now people are saying, oh, you feel that? Well, then that's naturally you. Just go ahead and do what you want. But do you know, while everybody seems to be doing what they want, you know what Jesus says? Go to Matthew 16. Jesus says in Matthew, the 16th chapter, 
while it seems everybody is saying, do what you want. I don't have any problem. You're going to Matthew 16 and somebody says, come as you are. I don't have any problem with that. I don't have any problem with that. Come as you are. Just understand you're not going to be saved as you are. What a simple message. Come as you are. Just understand God's not going to save you as you are. But that seems to be the part that's missing from a lot of quote unquote gospel messages today. Come as you are. I don't have any problem. I'll go to any organization, any group of people, and I will gladly go to them and say, listen, there is something sweet waiting for you at the house of God. Come just as you are. But just understand, God won't be saving any of us as we are. Any of us. Jesus makes it clear in Matthew 16. Right there in verse 24, the Bible says in Matthew, the 16th chapter, in the 24th verse, it says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself, Deny himself take up his cross, and follow me. You see, that's Jesus' message to the world today. The world is saying, you feel it, go do it. Jesus says, just because you feel it does not mean you should do it. If you're going to come after me, you need to deny yourself. Take up your cross. And this is not going to be something we're going to do on special occasions. And the reason why I say that is because haven't we fallen into this trap? You ever gave yourself credit because you denied yourself at a certain day at a certain time? You know how it is. You go to your favorite restaurant, you buy some food, and you're happy because you got that meal that you're craving. And that meal is in your car, and you are on your way home getting ready to just enjoy that food. And all of a sudden, you get by that stoplight. You get by the stoplight, and you see one of our little friends that come out with their notes on their cardboard saying, hungry. And somehow the Spirit of God begins to speak at your heart and says, you know what you need to do. You got that meal you just bought. You were ready to eat that thing. You couldn't wait to get home to eat it. It was one of your favorite dishes. But now the Spirit of God is saying unto you, you know you have food in your refrigerator that you can eat. And right now you got food in this car. Go ahead and you know what to do. Reluctantly, we start saying, oh, Lord, I don't know if I want to do this. But you know what? God just starts impressing stronger. You know what you need to do. And we say, all right, Lord. All right. I'll go ahead and give it to him. You roll down your window. Hey, come. The person comes, oh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. And we say, no problem. And of course, we say, God bless you. We give them that food, and we drive home and go to eat. A few days go by. I'm just wondering if I'm speaking to human beings right now. I realize y'all might be a bunch of holy angels, but I'm, I'm just speaking to regular human beings right now, if there's any in this room. Sometimes you get in your car, and... You get an opportunity a few days later, you got a little extra change, and you say, you know what? I'm going to buy that dish again. And you go ahead and you buy that food. And when you buy that food, you got it sitting in your car, can't wait to get home to eat it. You remember the light where you ran into one of your friends that you gave it to, so you probably might take a detour, you know, go a different way home. <laughs> just, just to avoid potential conviction. Yes. <laughs> we go ahead and we go a different direction, and we try to get home, and all of a sudden we're at a different light, and there's a different person with a cardboard, same message. And sometimes we say, Lord, I already denied myself two, three days ago. I'm going to act like I don't see this person right now. And I'm like, come on, light, turn green. Turn green, turn green, all right, it's green. And then we just drive off. And we go home. And sometimes we give ourselves this indirect credit. I denied myself at such and such a time in such and such a place, and I did the will of God. Therefore, it was all right for me not to deny myself that day, that time, and I'm just going to go ahead now and continue on my journey home. There are some people, not all people, but there are some people, probably a majority of people, who think like that. And you know that's why Jesus did not leave that counsel in Matthew 16, 24. He gave us another counsel in Luke 9. Go to Luke 9. And there's a key word in Luke 9 that changes everything. The Bible says in the book of Luke, we're looking at the ninth chapter, and I want you to see what the Bible says here. In Matthew 16, 24, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and 
follow me. Amen. But now look at Luke 9. And this is especially good for those of us who get caught up into those little glorification moments. Lord, I did you will on this day at this time. I'm not going to do it today or whatever. The Bible says in Luke 9 and verse 23. The Bible says in Luke 9 and verse 23, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. What's that next word? Daily. Daily. And follow me. We must be like Jesus all the day long, every day. There's no vacation. There's no time off. God calls us to reflect his image every day. Every day. And my brothers and sisters, we need to understand that in such a time as this in Earth's history, when there are so many people in the church and out of the church that are disconnected from God, God needs people that are about their father's business. He needs it. And some of the things that we are doing right now in the name of church, worship, and evangelism, God is getting ready to do a major cleanup act. Amen. I, uh, I see with clearer eyes than I've ever seen in my life what God wants. And I'm not saying it to say I have arrived. Please understand, I'm, I'm saying before the camera and before God's people, I have not arrived. I want you to understand that. I'm on a journey just like you. Some of us are a little further. Some of us are a little behind. The most important thing is make sure you're on. Amen. And if you're on the journey, the next thing I'm going to tell you is step fast. Okay? As long as you're on the journey, praise the Lord. But if you're on the journey, please step a little faster, okay? Because everything's wrapping up. Step faster. Now, God wants to glorify himself through us. He wants to take the weakest, the most decrepit, the most broke down, battered and bruised generation that has ever existed in humanity. And God said, those are the ones that I'm going to light the world up with my glory. A very special privilege has been set before us. It is in Revelation, the 18th chapter, and we can turn there, that God shows us the last gospel message to go forward in a dying world. And our world is dying. It's in a very seriously bad condition. Our country is getting closer and closer to a point where there will be no remedy. Many in the church, if we're not careful, we're getting to a place where there will be no remedy for us. And God does not want us to arrive at such a deplorable state. And so he's giving us messages in more ways than one, to try to help us to understand our true condition. You know, there's one thing that I realized. I know you're in Revelation 18. Just keep your finger there. But I'm going to say something to you that, that has, it's never been so clear to me. Did you know God actually means what he says? Amen. Amen. He really means what he says. And I'll let you know another solemn truth I realize. He's going to get what he wants. He's going to get what he wants. God really means what he says, and he's going to get what he wants. I remember when we were getting a restaurant started in Massachusetts. It wasn't wasn't we getting a restaurant per se, but, you know, there there was... a group of brothers that I knew was getting a restaurant started, and, and uh, one of the leaders at uh, Tacoa Missions, which I was a part of, they, they uh, were going to be a key player in getting that restaurant started. So we all decided, we said, let's get the book Health Food Ministry. Let's go through the book Health Food Ministry. And 
we all prayerfully read Health Food Ministry cover to cover. And I remember reading that, and it never became so clear to me why so many Seventh-day Adventist restaurants fail. So many. It, 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 it's not even a mystery to me anymore. And I remember that when I finished reading Health Food Ministry, I walked away with this understanding. God really means what he says. If we don't do it his way, he's so patient. I mean, he is long suffering. Amen. But there comes a time where mercy can run out and judgment will, be ha will have to begin. OK. And I remember that going through this, I thought to myself, I said, Lord. We have to understand that when Jesus says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, he actually meant it. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you mind if I talk to you? I mean, I really want to just talk to you. Amen. You know, I just, I just want to talk to you, okay? We're saying amen. We're nodding our heads. But I really believe the majority of us don't get how serious God is about what he says and what he requires. I think the majority of us don't get it yet. He's being very patient with us and he's very merciful. He's very long suffering. Amen. There's a degree of parenthood that he called us to that many of us as parents are frustrating the gospel and it's negatively impacting our children. There are husbands and wives that God has said, this is the kind of husband I have called you to be. This is the kind of wife I've called you to be. And many of us are frustrating the gospel and not allowing God's spirit to have full dominion and rulership over us that we might be the house band and queen of the household that God has called us to be. Some of us have allowed our doctrinal understanding of present truths to somehow be a, 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 an escape goat for all the unrighteousness that we're doing. And because we know how to answer verses and spirit of prophecy quotes before the preacher finishes quoting them, we actually got to a place where we actually think that that gives us some level of merit and good standing before God. And you read Desire of Ages, page 209, that's the same exact mistake the Pharisees made. Same exact mistake. It says the great mistake of the Pharisees is that they thought that an intellectual assent to truth constituted righteousness. Same exact mistake. A lot of us can make that same mistake. And so what God has to do is something very special. Very special. Amen. You see, are you still in Revelation 18? In Revelation 18, look at this. It says, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having the great power, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. There's going to be a loud cry, a loud cry, a repetition of the three angels' messages. The only difference is that it's going to just be so much more powerful than previously. The people of God are going to light up the earth with God's glory and are going to give what would almost be termed an irresistible message. And anyone who has ears to hear will hear. And they're going to follow Jesus. You and I have the privilege to be counted amongst this group. We have the privilege that as we strive and cooperate with the master, that God can get us to a place that we can be counted amongst this number. That'll glorify God. You know, I spent, I've been on this earth for 45 years, 45 years old, and, you know, 
the great majority of those years, I have not glorified God. Even in my uh, seven-day Adventist years, you know, I didn't glorify God. In different ways, I could see as glorifying self and falling into all sorts of death traps of the devil. And Lord Jesus just keeps delivering and delivering and delivering. Bless his name. And there are people who want to be part of this group for different reasons. Some people don't want to die because, you know, whoever gives a loud cry is going to be counted amongst the number that's going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. And they will not die. So some people are afraid of dying. They don't want to die. So they say, Lord, let me be counted amongst that group. So their motive is wrong. Because those who give the loud cry are going to see so much evil that they might be, if I may say, envious of those who are sleeping in Jesus. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Those who go through the time of Jacob's trouble are going to go through a mental anguish that is going to be worse than death. So we ought not think that this group is just going to be skating into the kingdom unscarred. Yes, they won't die, but they're going to have a lot of scars. A lot of battle scars. Yes. I don't know what your motivation is if you want to be part of that group. How many of you want to be part of this group? Just so I can, how many of you want to be part of the group that glorifies God, lights up the earth with God's glory? Okay, so I just want you to understand that if we're going to be part of this group, there's a motive of why you want to be part of it. And what I would recommend is you definitely check your motive. I spent the majority of my life giving glory to the devil, bringing shame even to the heart of Jesus. I want to spend the final moments of my life in earth's history honoring him. Amen. I really want to honor him. I want to put a big smile on his face. Amen. I want to make his heart happy. That he could say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And so if he sees it fit to allow me to be part of this group, by his grace, I will be part of this group that I may honor him, that I may give him glory. And you pray about your motives, brothers and sisters, because God pays attention far more to our motives than our actions. Amen. But if you do want to be part of this group that's going to light up the earth with the glory of God, there's something God wants us to know. Go to John 15. In John, the 15th chapter, a very powerful chapter in the Bible. Amen. Very, very powerful chapter in the Bible. Jesus makes some points here that are very, very plain. And we're just going to study it a little bit. In verse 1, it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. So let's just get some things straight. Who's the vine? Jesus, who's the husbandman? The father. Okay, good. Then it says, every branch in me. Who represents the branches? We do. Us. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, what does God do? He takes it away. Now, this, this, this verse 2 is power-packed. And a lot of times, I think we can miss it if we're not careful. God makes it clear. Jesus says, I'm the true vine. The father is the husbandman. We are the branches. Then he says, every branch. How many branches? Every. He said every. So is there any branch that could be excluded? No. If you're in Christ, you're one of the branches. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. What does God do with those branches? He takes it away. So if we're a fruitless branch, then God gets rid of us. We're, taking, we're out of the way. We're removed out of the way. You understand that? If we're fruitless. That's why Jesus, when he was walking with the disciples, you know, he looks at a tree, sees no fruit on it. A lot of leaves, but no fruit. And then he says, all right, we'll give it one more year, what have you. Still, no fruit. Eventually, Jesus can curse the tree, and the tree withers right there. It's taken away. It's gone. It's worthless. There's no fruit. 
We're told in the book Christ Object Lessons that the life of the Christian is a life of fruit bearing. There's no sense in being a Christian or calling ourselves Christians if we don't have any fruit. So if we don't have fruit, he gets rid of it. I wonder what he does with those that do have fruit. Now, let's look at it. It says, and how many branches? Well, let's start at verse 2 from the beginning. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes it away. And how many branches? Every branch that bears fruit. What does Jesus do with branches that actually are bearing fruit? He prunes it. And what is the purpose of the pruning? That it bears more fruit. Now, let's make sure we understand what the verse is saying. Because we're talking about real preparation for the final crisis. You know, everybody has their different spins on how to prepare for the final crisis. I haven't heard this subject much, much often. We need to talk a lot more about this one. Yeah. This, this is preparation for the final crisis? That's a lot deeper than a lot of other messages on preparation for the final crisis. If we are a branch and we bear no fruit, God just removes us. But if we are a branch and if we are bearing some fruit, he purges us. But the purpose of the purging is that what? We will bear more fruit. Have you ever gone through? Well, before I even ask that, purge. What does the word purge mean? Cleanse or clean. What made you say that, if you don't mind my asking? In the marginal reading of my Bible. Very good. <laughs> okay. What does the word, I don't, um, just in case anybody didn't hear what my brother said, what do you understand the word purge to mean? Every branch in me that bears fruit, he purges it. What do you understand that word purge to mean? We heard one right here which says cleanse. Any others? To get rid of. Well, he gets rid of the ones that bear no fruit. So if you're bearing fruit, he purges. So he's not going to get rid of them. Purge must mean something else. What, what does the word purge mean? What do you understand that word to mean? With all that getting, get understanding. What's the point of reading the Bible if we don't understand it? Come on, talk to me, family. Say again. Sanctify. So the purge means to sanctify. Good. Thank you. Anybody else? Washing. Okay. Washing. Good. Anyone else? Let's take two more. Purge. What does it mean? Need a dictionary. All right. Yes. Say again now. To, okay. To take out what does not belong. Okay. Very good. Now. I, I appreciate all the answers. I'm going to agree with what my brother's margin says. If you were to look just in the original on the word purge, it means to cleanse. It means to cleanse. Now, what do you cleanse? What, what do you clean? Let's think. What do you clean? Yes. Well, you're cutting out the part that doesn't bear fruit. You're purging. Right? Okay, yes, yes, good. But I'm asking the question. The word purge means cleanse. So my question is, what do we generally clean? Say again. Very good. That's the simple answer I'm asking for. You know what you clean? Something that's dirty. Do you clean a clean thing? No, you only clean that which is dirty, that which requires cleansing. Yes? So that means that Jesus was saying, every branch in me that's bearing fruit, I'm going to cleanse you because there's still something on you that's dirty even though you're bearing fruit. And I need to cleanse you. Now, here's the key. You don't get cleansed until you realize you're dirty. Is that right? Go to the book of Malachi chapter 3. Watch this. Malachi chapter 3. If you look at Malachi, the third chapter, God will help us a little bit here. In Malachi chapter 3, keep your finger on John 15. We'll get back there. But we're going to Malachi chapter 3. This is a most vital message, my brothers and sisters. It's vital. Vital, vital, vital. Malachi, we're looking at the third chapter. And when you get there, please say amen. amen. All right. In Malachi 3, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, 
and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a what? A refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and what else? Purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now watch. When you take gold and when you take silver and you put it in a refiner's fire, it goes through a purging. The purging removes the impurities but leaves the pure elements intact. You understand that? That's why God's desire is not to take away our fruit. If we're bearing fruit, he's not trying to take away the fruit. He's just trying to remove the impurities that's inhibiting us from bearing what? More fruit. You follow that? Okay, very good. Let's go back to John 15. So look at this. Jesus makes it clear. God is trying to prepare us for the most grand demonstration of the gospel that this world will ever see. He's about to light up this earth with the glory of God, the character of God. God is giving you and I a preparatory chance to be part of this group. He knows us very well. He knows who will comply and who will not. He already knows. In this... God's desire is that for those of us who will be part of this group, we are going to light up the earth with his glory. But in order for that to happen, Jesus is now walking us through these steps that if we are as branches bearing fruit, he's going to purge us for the purpose of bringing about more fruit. Fruit. The purpose of the purging is to cleanse us from the things that remain that are inhibiting us from bearing more fruit. That's why verse 3 says what it says. What does it say in John 15, 3? He sa after he talked about the whole purging thing, he says in verse 3, now you are clean through what? So what's the cleansing agent that Jesus is going to use in the purging process? He's going to use his word. This is why, like never before, you have to know your Bible. Please hear what I'm saying to you, family. I'm not saying this for the purpose of any type of special accolade or anything. I'm just telling the truth. I have had the privilege of training a lot of God's people, missionaries and pastors and all sorts of folks. And it's funny, when you ask somebody, what do you believe about this? You ask them, what do you believe? What's righteousness by faith? What is this? What is that? You ask them a bunch of questions. I, I marvel at how many of us either really don't know what we believe, number one. Number two, we'll give a right answer, but you'll see when, when, if, if we do this uh, training, if we do it, you'll see that my follow-up question, most of them can't answer. And the follow-up question is, all right, you gave the right answer. Where'd you get that from? You ask them that. What do you believe about this subject? Oh, well, I believe this. Let's say they get the right answer. Okay, praise the Lord. Now the next question, where'd you get that from? One of two things happen. Either they don't know where they got it from, or they give you an Ellen White answer. When they give me an answer from Ellen White's writings, then what I do is I say, do me a favor, go to Great Controversy 595. And then they go to Great Controversy 595, and then I show them, God will have a people who have and use the Bible and the Bible alone for the basis of all doctrine and the foundation of all reforms. So every doctrine you believe in, every reform you practice, dress reform, health reform, Sabbath reform, education reform, whatever the reform is, music reform, whatever reform you practice, God says you are supposed to have Bible for why you do that, right? So then I'll say, okay, where is that in the Bible? Because we can't go to the people in Portland and talk about Ellen White says. Because then they have the right to say what their guru says. So we can't go like that. We got to tell them, thus saith the Lord. We got to take them to the Bible first. You understand that? Simple. Amen. So what God is saying is that this is, this is very, very simple. 
So we have to know the word. But outside of all that witnessing activity, the only way we can get cleansed is by the word. Fire. The refiner's fire is part of the purging process. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Yes. Here we go. This is it. 1 Peter chapter 1. Watch what the Bible says. Okay? The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, if you're there, please say amen. amen. All right. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, uh, look right there at verse 7. It says, that the what of your faith? No, well, hold on now. Well, that, see, that might be a translation issue. I don't know. I'm reading from King James. All right? In the King James, it says the trial of your faith. Okay? That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with what? Fire. Fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So when we go through this fire, it is referred to as a trial. What brings us through the fire that the purging process may reach its completion is the word. If you don't have word, you're not going to know how to make it through the fire. Are you following that? This, this is so imperative for the people of God, and I am serious. Speaking from experience, and I'm telling you, one man with experience will dominate 99 men with theory. I'm speaking from experience. I'm telling you the truth. This is the word of God. If we go through trials and we don't have word to combat that trial, that trial will consume you. The devil will have victory over us. You need word. You can't say, thus saith my favorite evangelist. You can't even say, thus saith the spirit of prophecy, simply by itself. You got to know how to go to the word. You got to know how to pick up your Bible and know how to go there and hit those points and those quotes and then let the prophet of God magnify what the scriptures are saying. Save you from a thousand perils, my brothers and sisters. I'm serious. Why am I making this point? Because, listen, how many branches did Jesus say? Every branch. Every branch that bears fruit, he's going to have to purge us. The purpose of the purging is not to hurt us. The purpose of the purging is not to kill us. The purpose of the purging is not to destroy your faith. The purpose of the purging is to make you stronger. It's to help you. Why? Because we're getting ready to go through a time where only the strong will survive. You understand that? We're strong in Christ. 1 John 2, 14. But we got to become stronger. So let's make this practical. If there's one thing I know for a fact that every single one of us in this room have and go through our trials. Does not matter if you're black or white. Does not matter if you're male or female. Does not matter if you're young or old. Does not matter if you're from one country or you're all from America. The one thing that I can guarantee we all have in common is that we have trials. We got problems. And the question is, how do you solve your problems? How do you deal with your problems? When your problems arise, what do you do? Do you go with the thoughts that ring in your head? Because that's dangerous. The Bible says the heart, the mind, is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Why would you consult something that is deceitful and desperately wicked on what to do? That's the worst thing to do. But that's how a lot of us make decisions. And so what God wants us to understand is that when the trial comes, God says it's an opportunity. 
That's the first lesson I want you to understand. When a trial comes to you, stop looking at it as trouble. Start looking at it as an opportunity. When you and I are going through the trials of life, praise the Lord, this is an opportunity to find out something. God's going to show me something. Because there's generally two ways you suffer, as a wrongdoer or as the righteous. You understand that? Those are generally the two ways we're going to suffer. Now, somebody says, but I'm not suffering. Well, I got news for you. Go to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Watch this. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Very clear. This is the word of God. 2 Timothy, look at chapter 3. It's amazing. When, when the, when the, when the, uh, in the days of the apostles, when somebody would join the church, they understood we could lose our lives for this. They understood it, it was like a serious thing to become a Christian in the days of the apostles in the early church because they were under a power source that hated Christianity. And then they also, not only was they under Rome, but they also were under a bunch of hating Jews. So there was persecution on the left hand and on the right, and literally the, the people understood if we profess this, if we confess this, we are in trouble. But they said death before dishonor of God and his law will be our motto. Amen. And that needs to be our motto. And so the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, it says in 2 Timothy 3, right there in verse 12, it says, yea, and how many? All. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer, suffer persecution. It's going to happen sooner or later. It'll be direct persecution from Satan himself, or it might be from brethren, or it might be from strangers. But it doesn't matter. All who live godly in Christ Jesus. If you're living godly, are you bearing fruit? You better believe it. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. And do you know at the end of the day, the fruit of the Spirit is Christ-likeness? You know, if you want to just keep it like super simple. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Christ-likeness. Because Jesus had love. He had joy. He had peace. He was very long-suffering. You know, you can go down the list. All of that is a description of Jesus. The fruit is Christ-likeness. That's what he wants to see. And so it is that when we look at this, God is saying, we're all going to go through it. If you're not going through it, you will. But we don't have to fear it if we understand it right. I wish I had this message before November 2016 came. It would have helped me a lot. When some things start happening in yours and my life, brothers and sisters, God wants you to approach it with the right attitude. If you're taking notes, write this down, please. Messages to young people, page 117. It's a very, very good section of that book. I would encourage you to read the entire page because there's some beautiful gems in there. Putting Christ first, last, and best in your life, etc., but I want you to think about this. Messages to Young People, page 117, says, the trials of life are God's workmen, showing unto us the roughness and impurity of our own characters. What does that mean? There are things sometimes that God is trying to show us about ourselves that for some reason we keep missing the lesson, missing the lesson, missing the lesson, missing the lesson. So what God then decides to do is he says, I'm going to allow some trials to come. Allow, not ordain. I don't believe God ordains trials to come in our lives, but he allows them. God did not ordain his people to go into captivity. He allowed it. But he knew it would work together for good because not only will I win my people back, I'll win Pharaoh, I'll win Nebuchadnezzar, I'll win a whole bunch of other heathens that I probably never could have reached anyhow. God is always two steps ahead of Satan. Always. So God does not ordain, he doesn't want us, per se, to go through trials, but he knows rightly received 
He knows that trials can have a very powerful effect. You, you want to see, see the effect of trials? Because when you go through trials, you go through suffering. Would you agree? Some level of suffering, whether it's mental, spiritual, physical, something, financial, you're going to go through something. Go to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. What, what, what is the end result of all of these things? Hebrews chapter 2. What does the Bible say? The Bible says right there in Hebrews chapter 2, and this is the fruit of all fruit. <laughs> the Bible says in Hebrews 2, right there in verse 10, Hebrews 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons onto glory to make the captain of their salvation. That's talking about Jesus. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through what? Suffering. Sufferings. God knows a trial rightly received will bring about the beautiful, sweet fruit of perfection. Can I show you how he says it in another way in the book of Hebrews? Go to the book of Hebrews 12. And if you look at Hebrews 12, he says it again. He says it just in a different way. God always gives at least a second witness, if not more. Notice what the Bible says now. In Hebrews, we're looking at the 12th chapter, and we're going to go ahead and start it at verse 5, picking up a little bit after the story begins. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5, if you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the what? Chastening, Chastening of the Lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him, for whom the Lord, what? Loveth, he chasteneth. You can't forget these lessons, family. Don't forget these lessons. I'm telling you, you're going to be tempted to forget these lessons. Don't let the devil succeed in tempting you. Stay focused on this. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son. How many sons? Every, every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure, see, that's the key. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he, God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. holiness. God says if you endure the trial right, it's going to bring about the beautiful, sweet fruit of holiness, righteousness, perfection. So what does God say? God says... When you go through a trial, husband and wife are estranged. Husband and wife, arguing, fussing, and fighting. Husband and wife, no longer heaven in the home. Maybe it never was. You get to a place where probably, if you're not careful, you'll go into such deep despair that you'll say, Lord, why am I going through all this? God says, I already told you why. God says, I told you why. Okay? God says, I'm allowing this to take place. Because if you receive this trial right, God says it's going to bring out some fruit. Now watch this. In this idea, what, what makes up receiving it right? Well, remember, what's the purpose of the purging? To do what? Amen. To cleanse us. But you can only cleanse that which is dirty, and you got to be able to see your dirty condition so you can see your need for cleansing. You understand that? Yeah. Now watch this. That means whenever a trial comes in your life, the first thing God wants you to do is go to his word. Now, please understand, like I said, I warned you in the beginning. I said, some people, this will fly past them. Other people, you're going to get your key to victory. What I'm saying to you is when the trial comes, you got to say, okay, a trial is here. What is the purpose of a trial? Messages to Young People 117. The trials of life are God's workmen, showing unto me the roughness and impurity of my character. So what I'm going to do is when I go through this trial, I'm going to start investigating my character and comparing it to God's word. 
Where am I going wrong? Let's use something that perhaps a great number of us in this room can relate to. Sickness. Sickness is something we can relate to. Sickness can be something as simple as chronic low back pain, and it can be as bad as cancer. When we go through sickness, that is not our opportunity to say, Lord, why, why did you abandon me? No, don't even go there. The first thing to remember is if we are diagnosed with whatever it is, first step is I'm going to say, all right. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. So because I understand that, that's Ministry of Healing 127, or if you want Bible on it, just go to Numbers 11 and uh, take a look. Numbers, I'm sorry, Numbers 12, forgive me. Yep. Numbers 12, and you can pretty much read it down from verse 1, but verse 11 is key. And in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 11, it makes it very clear, after uh, Miriam gets stricken with a disease, which is leprosy, real disease, it says in verse 11, And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, wherein we have sinned. Sin causes disease. Sin causes disease. Whether it's violation of physical or spiritual law, the bottom line is it causes disease. Violation of God's law causes disease. So disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of God's laws of health. So the first thing I want to do as I am now stricken with the disease is I want to start going down God's laws of health. Where is my life out of harmony with these things? And as I start going through, I'm going to start going through godly trust. For most of us, it's right there. Because nine-tenths of diseases begin in the mind. When you don't have godly trust, you don't have peace, you have perplexity. You have stress. And literally, you look at all the latest scientific books. Stress can bring on type 2 diabetes. Stress can bring on hypertension. Stress can bring on cancer. Stress can bring on heart disease. Stress can stop your heart. I mean, you can go down the list. Stress. And I've never heard of somebody who is trustfully stressed out. Never even heard of it. Doesn't even make sense. You understand that? Never heard of it. I am stressfully trust. I am, I am trustingly stressed out. There's no such That's an oxymoron. Literally, trust in God relieves a lot of that chronic stress. I mean, nothing wrong. You stressing because you, you pumping some iron and, and strengthening your muscles. That's good stress. But I'm not talking about that kind of stress. I'm talking about that peace that passes all understanding that we know nothing about. God says that kind of stress got to go. That stuff will kill you, and it will kill young people. Yes. It'll kill young people. And so when we when we get diagnosed with whatever it is, the first thing God wants us to do, look back. What is it in the laws of health that I'm not following? Am I not drinking my water? If you knew how many diseases can result as a result of dehydration. Exercise. Do you know that over 45% of all cancers, 50% of all diseases can be totally prevented if we would exercise daily. This is statistics. I mean, I got all the scientific, I got all that data on my computer. We come back and do the medical missionary training, we talk about it. But what I'm telling you is that literally all of these things, there's so much that can be warded off if we would just get up and stop sitting down so much. Amen. And, and I'm not, when I say exercise, I'm not, do you know what the world statistic is? The world statistic is 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Constant aerobic movement, something like this, brisk walking. You do brisk walking, 30 minutes straight, and just let your heart just do, 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 do. They say that thing can ward off, and I mean they name the cancers, colon, lung, pancreatic, 
A lot of that GI stuff, I mean, just, whew. God, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. So what God is saying is he's simply saying, listen, when something happens, don't go back and just start saying, oh, Lord, why? Why'd you? And start going and attacking God and charging him with folly. God says, go back, investigate yourself. Where is my life out of harmony with your word? If your children one day come home and the sweet, godly child you thought you have have proven themselves a devil. As mother and father, you're saying, I homeschooled. I did everything right. How could this be? What does God say? God says, go back to my word. Look again at what I said should be done with the children. Find out where did I disconnect. We see it, we say, oh, right there, this is what I miss with my child. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. We apologize. We go before God in repentance. We go to our children. We say, children, daddy, mommy should have done this for you. We didn't do it. We're so sorry. Can you give us another chance? That child, though rebellious, thank the Lord we got angels that help us. Yeah. And those angels start touching that child's heart. And we, from that day forward, start doing that which is right and holy and just before God, and we begin to see our children come back, not only to Jesus' heart, but to ours. Amen. Guess what? You've been cleansed by the word. More fruit. God says, that's all I wanted. God is trying to help us understand trials are going to come. My brothers and sisters, Listen, I'm talking to you from my heart. I'm the evangelist. I'm the guy who travels, and I preach, and I teach, and I do counseling, and all these other things. And it seemed as if, in my mind, I felt so strong in Jesus. I really did. And then one day, my doctor told me, we got to do heart surgery on you, Mr. Lemon. I'm like, hold up. I keep the laws of health. And all of a sudden, God started saying, um... It's true, when I was a child, strep throat, rheumatic fever, damaged my heart valve. That's true. I didn't know any better. I didn't know anything. I was a child. But am I helping the situation when I'm staying up late at night? Not watching TV, but if I'm staying up late at night because I'm like, I got to study the Bible to help the saints. No. If any man strives for the mastery, he must be temperate in all things. And so there were many a nights that I stayed up late, many a nights, had the nerve to go around telling God's people, y'all need to follow the laws of health and go to bed at decent hours, etc. And here I am for some reason because I'm a soul winner, because I'm, I'm doing the work of the gospel. For some reason, that principle did not apply to me. So I would stay up late night after night and my body wouldn't get a chance to heal itself like it normally would. Tell everybody, drink your water. Take your body weight, divide it in half. That's how many ounces you need to be drinking daily. And I told him that. And God gave me a solemn warning because I went to the Philippines and I was there preaching and teaching. Went to bed one night. Started feeling all this pain in my back. What in the world is this? Pain started getting worse and worse and worse. Turned out to be a kidney stone. I was so thoroughly dehydrated. But why was I dehydrated? Was I looking at water saying, I don't want that. I wasn't doing that. I said, I'm busy doing the work. I forget, you know, sometimes I forget to drink the water, but that's all right. God will, be, God, will, God will be my water. Jesus said he's the water of life. That's all right. I was drinking. Exercise. Brothers and sisters, I'm slim. I can still drop into a split and all that stuff from back in the days, like when I used to dance. In my mind, I'm fit. When I preach... As you can see, I, I, I walk from the right side, and then I, I walk to the left. I look at my little watch and say, hey, Dwayne, you did, you did, uh, did 10,000 steps today. I say, that's my exercise. Do you, do you see how we can easily violate God's laws and give all these fake, weak justifications for it? And you just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And God is letting us know gently, ever so softly, it's not enough. Come up higher. There's times I'm preaching to violate the laws of health is to violate the law of God. Do you get it? The church says amen. And the Holy Spirit says, do you get it? Yeah. 
And so finally, I see my cardiologist. He says, Mr. Lemon, we have to go in on your heart. Now, what did I do? Lord, why? I'm your soldier. I've given my life for this work, Father. Why? You gonna let me go down like that? I'm starting to find a relatability between Paul when he called himself the chief of sinners. The world is encouraged by Dwayne Lemon. But Dwayne Lemon didn't follow through on the things he was encouraging the world to do. Not to the, not to the level that I was preaching. When I preached, I preached it with power. I believed it. But I allowed these excuses to get in the way. And I had to go up to the surgical table. And it was like God got the victory on the day of surgery. I remember laying there on that table, on that gurney, and looking in the room. And I just said, Lord, this, this might be the last thing that I see. Yeah. That's a deep place to be, brothers and sisters, because they let you know, yes, there's a mortality rate. They said, oh, your, your health is pretty good. And that's the thing, in spite of so much disobedience, I would still have, like, good blood work and all this stuff. It was like God's grace was there. God sent a thousand signs to tell me, I'm going to pull you through this, but I just couldn't see it at the time. I couldn't see beyond the grave. My wife woke up one night, and she was crying. This was just a few days before the surgery, and I remember I woke up, and I heard her crying, and I, I started to sing. I started to sing a song to try to encourage her. And I said, honey, what's going on? And she said, I have decided to drink the cup. Remember Jesus had a cup to drink? It was very bitter. She resolved in her mind, if my husband dies, I will not turn my back on Jesus. I will stay with him. And I will accept God's will. Because she wanted me to live like any wife would. I wanted to live. And my brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, I remember being in that room looking at all those lights, watching everybody washing their hands and getting everything ready. And I said, Lord, this is it. Can you? All I know is life. I have never been sick. I visit hospitals. I don't get admitted. And here it is for the first time. I'm like, I can't believe this. They tell you, Mr. Lemon, you can have a heart attack right in the surgery. Your heart can go into AFib right here. Da -da -da. It can happen. And I remember laying there on that gurney, and I just said, you know what? Can I pray? And they said, sure. And we called the surgeon and everybody in. And I remember that I gave myself to Christ in a very special way. I said, Lord, this is it. I can tell them right now, excuse me, roll me back in the other room and put my clothes on, and I'm out of here. But in my mind, I'm like, I can't do that. I just can't. I've come too far to turn back now. And I told them, I said, listen, we're going to pray. And I prayed there, and I confessed my sins. And I just said, Lord, all I ask is that if I don't wake up from this, that the next voice that I hear will be the voice of Jesus when the trumpet sounds. Amen. And then I said, Lord, but if this is not unto death, Anoint the hands of these doctors, anesthesiologists, everybody, because I know it's going to take a miracle for them to repair this. And I said, Amen. And I had an abiding peace. Amen. Oh, wow. Amen. It was an incredible peace. And I said, All right, let's do it. And I watched him put the anesthesia in there, and I looked at it, and I said, you're done? He said, yep. And I said, hmm. And that's the last thing I remember. <laughs> that stuff works quick. <laughs> oh, but my brothers and sisters, I remember hearing a voice. I heard a, I heard a man's voice. Is he all right? OK, so he's going to be OK. And in my mind, I was like, that's dad. That's Thomas Jackson. I call him dad. I said, that's dad. 
And then I heard the most incredible music you could ever hear. It was an angel. And it was an angel's voice right there in my left ear. It was my wife. And my wife says, I love you. I love you. And it's like I got tubes in my mouth and everything. I'm kind of like, you know, half smiling. And I just said, I'm alive. I made it. And my wife says, they repaired your vow. The thing that I was told was impossible. Dr. Wong repaired it. He's a man of excellence. He has an awesome track record. And here I am seven months later, and I look back and I said, Father, I can't miss a single lesson of what I've gone through. And it's like the Lord began to show me so much. And for him to raise me back up to the point that I'm standing before God's people again, I have no time to play games with you. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I am here to tell you the truth. Amen. Many of us think that we are strong. Yeah. But when a man comes in contact with his own mortality, yeah. we'll discover things about ourselves that we didn't perhaps even know existed. And what I'm saying to you is that I want to give you a better preparation than I had. I owe that to the people of God. I am here to let you know when you go through those trials and when you go through those circumstances where you have no control over the situation, you cannot fix it. God is going to teach you how to trust him like we should have trusted him from the beginning. He's going to teach us lessons on faith that we should have learned from times past. And he's letting us know, when I let you go through these things, I'm not doing it to destroy you. I'm not doing it to kill you. He says, I'm doing this because I want to see more fruit in your life. I want to see more. You see, go back to John 15 as we prepare to close. It was right there in John 15. Every branch is going to go through it. Not, and you, you will go through the one that you need to go through. Not everybody's going to end up on a gurney. Not everybody's going to end up getting open heart surgery. Not everybody's going to have their chest cracked open. No, 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 no. But whatever it is you go through, it's going to stretch you to the core. Because God cannot have any of self remaining in us if we're going to be part of the group that will light up the earth with his glory. As I told you this morning in Sabbath school, what is justification? You see, justification by faith carries through sanctification. It carries through glorification. Why? Because there are two key principles in justification by faith. The first principle is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust. Does that not happen in sanctification? Amen. Will that not be the case in glorification? Yes, at no point. Will the glory of man be intermingled with justification, sanctification, or glorification? The second principle, God doing for man that which it is impossible for man to do for himself. That is a principle that carries through into sanctification. It carries through into glorification. At no point can self rise up in the picture and say, look at me, look at me. Look at what I've done. Look at this great Babylon I've built. None of that stuff will be accepted. We must know what it is to be broken at the foot of Jesus. Yeah. And so it is that Jesus says in John 15, verse 4, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. It's going to be an abiding in Christ, a dwelling in him. And do you know what that fruit looks like? If, that, if we are abiding in Christ, and, that, and, and, the, and the sap from the vine is flowing within our veins, what does it look like? 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, what does it look like? 
First John chapter 3. We're down to some final text here. First John chapter 3. Right there in verse 24. What does it look like? If we're abiding in Christ, oh, Lord, what does it look like? First John chapter 3. Right there in verse 24. It says, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Amen. If we're abiding in Christ, we'll naturally be able to keep his commandments. Amen. Again, if the, vine, if the sap from the vine is flowing through, we're going to keep God's commandments through the power of his Holy Spirit. You see, the problem is this. We're forgetting the principle of Gospel Workers, page 204. It says... What a man is has greater influence than what he says. There are a lot of us that want to do great things for God. Brothers and sisters, slow down. If you're connected to God, you will do great things. It, it's a default. The problem is many people are trying to do great things for God, but God does not have their heart. This is the plague in present truth. It's a plague. Everybody is caught up into doing and doing and doing and doing. We create conferences. We create all sorts of organizations. We create all sorts of things in the doing of the work. But God says, my son, give me thine heart. and Let thine eyes observe my ways. That's what God wants. Amen. He doesn't want all your actions. He'll get it. God is into maximization. If he gets our heart, he by default has our actions. You have never gone to a grapevine, and if you have, please tell me, you have never gone to a grapevine and seen it produce strawberries, have you? You've never seen that. If we're connected to the vine, we cannot help but to produce the fruit that comes from the vine. It will be Christ-like character. But the problem is, is we're trying to do a bunch of Christ-like things while he does not have our hearts, and that's why you still got ministers that will curse you out. How does a minister curse a person out? Because they're not connected to the vine. This is why you can have preachers and teachers that have fallen into the bed of fornication. And committing sexual sin. Why? Because they're doing a lot of great things, but they were not connected. And you know what God is doing? God is exposing that foolishness. God is saying, I have pleaded with these hearts. That's why we're seeing all this stuff coming up in our church. God says, I have pleaded, and I have pleaded, and I have pleaded, and it seems like there's no other way to get their attention. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to allow an exposure. When I think of the brilliant stars, the mighty stars in this church that are going out and have gone out. Talking with my brother last night about one, one gentleman. I certainly wouldn't call his name publicly, but mighty. Mighty. I, I sat under his teachings myself and have been thoroughly benefited. And when I think of the day that he's, he's, he's walking away, and I'm like, how do you do that? That's suicide. Amen. That is spiritual suicide. But my brothers, this is, this is where we're at. And that's what I'm saying. It, it's not enough for us to know what is truth. What a man is has greater influence in what he says and what he does. And so I have learned, and I pray you learn. We have to have a deeper communion with God. We have to realize how to tap into his heart and let him tap into our heart that we might be like him. That is our prayer. None of this, oh, Lord, I want to do great things. I want to turn Portland upside down. Oh, don't worry. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But it's only going to happen through the people whom God says, there goes my son, there goes my daughter, and I have their heart. That's what he wants first. 
The trial is simply to open our eyes to help us see our great need for him. And the more that we see it, something special happens. Let's go back to John 15 for our final statement. You see, if we cooperate with Jesus and let him have this level of success that he wants to have with us, if we cooperate with him, I want you to see what will happen. Verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned, because there's no fruit. Verse 7. But if he abide in me, and my what? If my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. You know, I told my wife yesterday in the car, my wife knows me very well, and I got this thing that I do. I don't mean to do it. It's just that I'm, I'm always thinking. And so I'm driving in the car, and I just go, <laughs> and my wife says, what's up? What's, what's going on? What happened? And I said, well, I said, Peter must have had such a relationship with Jesus. And she's like, why do you mean? And I said, well, the reason why is because think about it. Peter did not have any Bible verse but he, with assurance, went to Tabitha and said, Tabitha, get up. And he commanded a dead woman to rise. And in my mind, I'm like, how did he know that she would rise? I'm, I, literally, I, I thought about it, because I like to think through Scripture. I'm like, you know, there's been lots of people who have had dead people over them. I'm sure there's been mothers, fathers, children, parents, whatever, that have had their dead loved ones and said, rise, in the name of Jesus, rise. You know, just, just trying to see, is that Pentecostal gospel power present with me today? Is that early rain power with me today? But Peter, with 100% confidence, says, Tabitha, rise. And Tabitha rises up. Paul is preaching until midnight. Young man sitting by the window, that brother gets sleepy. And he just, whoop, falls out the window, boom, dies. Paul was preaching, sees a guy fall out the window. All right, let's hold on. Paul goes downstairs, goes to the young man, says, young man, get up. Raises the brother from the dead. Goes back up, and Paul says, now, turn your Bible. So he, he finishes the message and preaches till sunrise. And I'm saying, I want that connection. No, but hear me good. I'm not like a Simon Magus. I'm not trying to, ooh, let me have that power for my own person. I'm saying, I want to have such an intimate communion with God that God can talk to me and I to him. Desire of Ages 668, you had to read it. It says very clearly, God will speak his mysteries to you personally. I'm like, man, the Lord can talk to me. He could talk to me like that? I want him to talk to me like that. That's what I want. I want to have such closeness and communion with God. So when I read verse 7, and it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. The, the, the union between the creator and creation is so tight that they have full confidence that what I'm asking for, I know already God will do it. This is what can happen if we successfully go through the purging process. So much fruit, so much Christ-like character. And then verse 8, and that's our closing verse. It says, herein is my Father, what? glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Not one person will be part of that loud cry and light up the earth with God's glory that has not successfully gone through the purging process. Every branch will have to go through it before probation closes. And God is saying to you, as he's saying to me, 
He's saying, where's your heart? Who has your heart? What has your heart? Because I know for sure God wants it. I know for sure he wants it. And sometimes we can frustrate the process so much. Yes, he's called us to come after him and deny ourselves, but sometimes we're not getting the message. So you know what God has to do? He allows that trial to come in to wake us up. Say, do you understand how much you need me? Brothers and sisters, what God requires of us, there's nothing natural about it. It is wholly supernatural. And it's going to require a level of surrender that I think the majority of us have yet to taste it. But you know what? I want to taste it. I have decided. I have decided. I will follow you, my Savior. Wheresoever thy lot may be. Where thou goest, I will follow. Yes, my Lord, I'll follow thee. If it be for thy glory, O God, so let it be done. If we can train our minds and train our tongues to speak that language, if it be for thy glory, so let it be done. I accept the trial that I'm going through. I will go to your word for guidance, counsel, and instruction. And may the word, both written and living, have its cleansing effect upon our lives. And I believe in the end, we'll bear much fruit. And perhaps by the grace of God, we'll be counted amongst that number that will light up the earth with his glory. Amen. I have a question for you. How many of you understood the study? Is it your desire to say, Lord, purge me? You know, that's not an easy prayer to pray, is it? It's not an easy prayer to pray, is it? It's a very important prayer. Lord, purge me. Whatever's in me that's unlike you, purge me. I have learned some rich lessons through this experience. I actually can now say, thank God for my heart crisis that took place November of 2016. Because to a large degree, I was on a road of self-deceit and I didn't even see it. Didn't even see it. Swept me off my feet. And now that he has shown me the holes, those pockets that need to be plugged in, I am ever so grateful. Amen. And for him to give me the privilege? I've read lots of blogs on what happens to people after they go through open heart surgery and have these vows. I mean, none of those things happen. None of those things happen. It would be the most foolish thing in the world for me to go back to any of those little excuses that I used to make. It would be, it would be deadly for me to do that. And so I just hope and pray that you really got the message. I hope you're not counted amongst those that it just, it just flew by. My hope and my prayer is that we really get it. God is getting ready to do something powerful in this world in Portland, Oregon. He wants you to be part of his team. Amen. But the question is, are you willing to accept the purging? And if you're willing to accept the purging process, even to the point that you can say, Lord, purge me. Purge me. I want to invite you to stand to your feet with me. It's not an easy prayer to pray. But if we can remember that these trials, tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Amen.
the fruit of holiness, the fruit of the perfect reflection of the character of Jesus. All these things is what he wants to accomplish in you and me. Let us cooperate with this process. Pray for me, please. I still got healing. I got five more months of healing. They say this is a 12-month process. I feel residuals from the surgery all the time. Sitting back there, always feeling residuals from it. And if I wanted to, I could let the devil mess with my head. But no. God is in charge of my life. And he's in charge of yours if you let him. Let's go ahead and let's kneel for a word of prayer if you're able to kneel and seal the decision that we have made. Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the things that you have shown us. We thank you, Lord, for your wonderful words of life. Amen. Father, we praise you, even in the midst of our purging process. Amen. Though it be painful at times, dear God, in the end, we know that it will produce the sweet fruit of righteousness and holiness, the perfecting of the character of Christ, for this is what heaven's waiting for. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself and his people. When the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in us, then Jesus will come to claim us as his own. Lord, please help us to cooperate with you through the purging. Help us not to lose sight and to give in to temptation, but to go to your word to find our encouragement and our cleansing. Bless my brothers and sisters, dear God. Bless me and my household, Lord. We pray very solemnly and reverently, please, for Christ's sake and for thy glory, purge us that we might bear more fruit to thy name's honor and glory. Is our prayer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.